Thank you all for being here today. My name is H. Joseph Ehrman. I go by H and I'm a cognac educator here in San Francisco, California. And I've been here, uh, been with the BNIC and the cognac educator for a number of years now. I've had uh, a lot of fun teaching this class over the years and meeting a lot of great bartenders and spirits professionals from around the country. Uh, today, we're gonna go over some of the history and the production of cognac, get into a tasting and talk about making some cocktails with it. So when we go to the next slide and uh, we'll get this rolling. Here's a little video for you. about cognac. Cognac is a distillate made from grape wine, right? Um, could we go ahead to the next slide? Here we go. So uh, cognac comes specifically from this region of France. If you look in the lower left-hand corner there, there's a picture of France, right? The, the shaded area in the, in the um, map there is the Cognac region. And you can see that it comes, it's right along the Atlantic Ocean there. And this is key to the, 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 the terroir that uh, is particular that um, helps make the, the, these grapes so perfect for brandy and why this region is so special. Um, there are five different areas within this, uh, that are delimited and, and named specifically so that um, the, uh, the regions can be separated as well as uh, we know where these grapes come from. Can we go to the next slide that blows that up a little bit? The, at the center of that area, you see the orange and then there's a, within the, the, there's like a light green, then a dark green, and then an orange. And then within that orange, there's, there's two smaller. Um, so, on the outer area, you have the what's called the the bois ordinaire, and then the uh, the, the very light on the uh, along the coastal area, and then on the bone the the darker area going in is the bon bois, and then the darker darkest green there is called the fin bois. The small orange spot on the top there is borderies. And then the large is the Petite Champagne and the dark, darkest center there was Saison Zach is that's the Grand Champagne. And what's happening here is that the, the, the soil is different in each of these areas. And so the soil has a different effect on the grapes that are grown with the grapes growing with the, uh, the center there, uh, the, the, the Champagne region, the Petite Champagne, the Grand Champagne, uh, they, those produce the, the grapes that have the, the best long aging um, characteristics. And so that's where you'll see a lot of the, the, the most well-known um, houses coming from. Um, out into the, the, the grander areas, you'll see more of the bulk grapes that will be used in uh, a lot of the VS and VSOP agings. But nowadays, what's really interesting is you're starting to see smaller producers coming out with, uh, with, their, with their cognacs specifically from those regions, which is stuff that we had not seen before. Cognac is a blended product. So uh, go ahead and we'll, uh, I'll get to that in a bit, but go ahead to the next slide. We'll look at some statistics. Um, fourth largest uh, vineyard, vineyard French vineyard by area in France. It's the second largest wine producer. Um, it's, it's a major industry and it's a very significant economic driver for uh, French trade and it's growing. It continues to grow. It actually grew last year. The American market is uh, the most important market for cognac. And so you as professionals telling people about it, expanding uh, the knowledge and the appreciation of cognac is significant and very important and the main driver for this this program. So 
it's a, it's a great industry that employs a lot of people and it's very unique in the spirits world and the way that it's structured and the way that um, it works. Um, here, well, here's some of the numbers um, that show the merchants, the distillers, the wine growers. The, um, the um, wine growers are one segment of the industry. They're the, they're the ones that make the grapes, right? They're the farmers. And what they do is produce the, generally they will produce eau de vie that, which is the unaged spirit. They will do distillation and produce the unaged spirit which is called eau de vie de cognac, eau de vie, um, that is then sold to the larger houses that will mostly do the aging and then the blending. So not all wine growers are distillers. Some are, are, are growers and distillers, um, and, but some are just wine growers. And so it's a very unique ecosystem, economic ecosystem uh, between all of the different partners that eventually go to produce the cognac. So once the, the larger houses, what they do is generally, they are the, they are the merchants, they're the ones that will buy eau de vie from different um, producers. And, and those, some of those contracts go back generations. And they have their, they know that they're getting this kind of eau de vie from here and this from there. They put everything in barrel, they age everything. And then when they go to create their cognacs, they are, each, you think about these, these different cognacs that have been aged as ingredients. They are, it is a blended product. The majority of cognac is blended. There's not much vintage, although there is some vintage product. It is mostly blended. So it's much like making a cocktail. You've got barrels and barrels and barrels in, in your cellars and the master blender for a house is the one that really drives both of the tradition because the XO, the VSOP, the VS the, of, a, of a particular brand needs to stay consistent from year to year in, in its taste so that you have a, um, the, the consistency of that when you go get your, your Crovassier or your Remy or one of these bigger brands that you may know, uh, you expect it to taste the same. So the, they are in, in charge of making sure that that blend year after year hits that same palate and then they also will be in charge of creating new product and doing new product development. But that is how they do it by, by blending and sourcing from these long-term contracts. So go ahead to the next slide. The history goes way back, right? This is a, cognac is, is, a, is a very significant um, product in history, both culturally and economically. Um, it, the, the cognac, the town of Cognac sits on the Chalant River and it was originally a salt trading town with great history that, um, but the, the, the evidence of wine growing in the region goes way back. It was uh, back to the 11th century, already well known for wine trade as the, as the slide says. Um, and that was because of its access to the river, it made it a very important trade center that had access to the ocean and maritime movement of products. But it wasn't until the 16th century that the Dutch started to distill in, in the region in order to, um, to concentrate the flavors and the aromas of the wine into a distillation. And, and the Dutch, if you know much about distillation history, the Dutch are, are very important um, in, in rum and many products because of this same thing. They had this early distillation technology that they brought with them. They were very big merchants in international trade. And because of this, they had a significant impact on the development of these, um, these different spirits around the world and many other things. But um, the, the, the double distillation of this uh, spirit started to happen in the 17th century, the, the, the French, took over and improved the production process. And Cognac Auger was the first house to, um, to, to do this. And they are still in business today, 1643. And Cognac continued to develop and grow um, and, and move all over the world. It became a, uh, a really one of the uh, most significant um, international products in early trade. Uh, but as we get up to 1875, uh, kind of like the way that uh, 
cocktail culture uh, hit a peak and was crushed in 1919 by um, prohibition, it, the, the cognac trade was, was hit uh, dramatically as, as was all of wine in 1875 by the Laos phylloxera that destroyed the roots. And um, it was devastating that uh, to, to the industry and to the production. And so until they discovered to, that they could graft American rootstock onto these grape varietals and the American rootstock could, was resistant to, to the louse in the, in the soil, uh, they couldn't bring this back. And the grape that was dominant in production until that time was the full blanche grape. But when they grafted the full blanche onto the American rootstock, it didn't produce the same quality grape. And it uh, therefore, the Uni Blanc grape was the one that took over as the primary grape because it performed much better. These days they have, um, they started a new varietal that they've crossed two of them into some um, Faux Blanche and, and Uni Blanc. And, the, um, and uh, the, there's a new Faux Lognon is a new uh, varietal that they're working with and experimenting with. But because this takes literally generations to evolve, they are now limiting the production of that grape um, because it's gonna, they're gonna have to see how well it ages over time and before they, they, they see more widespread use of it. But primarily 98% of, of cognac production is Uni Blanc. There are other grapes like uh, Colombard and, and um, Faux Blanche that are used, but uh, not very much. The 20th century is where we see the industry start to evolve into something that's actually controlled and um, protected as, as an industry. The, those three dates, 1909, was the uh, the the the, 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 the def definition of that region of the cognac region. Uh, the rules of the of the regions were set in place in 1936, and in 1938, the five different crews are established, established, uh, and that therefore um, defining where those grapes come from over time and and the systems that we work today with the BNIC which is the, uh, the Bureau National Interprofessional of the Cognac is the organizing body that runs these rules and regulations and um, defines what cognac is today and what it will be moving forward. Go ahead to the next slide. This, this is um, two sets of rules that, that define what cognac is and, and, um, and protects it. One is the GI, the, the geographical indication by the European Union. Um, that is a, an acknowledgement by the European Union of what cognac is and, and where it is. And then the AOC is the, the French national control of, of the region. And those two combine um, to protect everything. Go ahead to the next slide. So um, high acid, low in alcohol, these are the two qualities of the Uni Blanc grape that make this, uh, as I said earlier, the, such a great grape for making uh, brandy. It does not make for great wine. It makes for uh, okay wa table wine, but it, is, uh, it, it makes for a, a distillate that ages very well and develops great character over time. Go to the next slide, please. The Charente distillation is is key here. This is the um, this is the still as you you see in the picture there. That's the classic um, still that everyone uses, uh, known as a, as a great brandy still. It has it's a traditional uh, pot still, but uh, it's a two times distillation, and you have uh, the the pot, the still head, the, the swan's neck. A, heat, a wine heater, which is that bulb on the, on the right there, uh, a condensing coil, and then we have the, the, um, the wine that comes out. Um, the distillation process is a bit different than what we would look at in say a whiskey or other pot distillation in, in a two-time distillation. You have the first parts that come off are called the um, the, the, bon, the, the first shelf is the, the first burn or the first uh, cuts that come off. You have um, a first fill that's as a max of 120 hectoliters. 
um, in 140 hectoliter capacity still, which comes off at about 27 to 32% ABV on that first cut. Then you have what's called the bone shelf. And the bone shelf is um, what, what is a, uh, a max fill of 25 hectoliters in a 30 hectoliter still. And that is, uh, we have heads that come off and then you have the seconds, the heads that are, the heads and the tails are um, um, redistilled with new wine in, in, the, in the second distillation. And we're looking at um, a distillate that comes off at a maximum of 72.4% ABV. Um, there's a number of different rules here that, that come out of the distillation run. They, um, it can't be higher than that. Um, the distillation must, can't go into the barrel any later than um, March 31st because harvest happens in sometimes late August these days with, with uh, climate change, but generally into September is the harvest. The wine is made and then the distillation season starts. And so distillation has to be completed by March 31st. And that's really to protect the wine in order to make sure that um, the, the quality is there. And so when you see the different, different vintages, that's the, the year of the distillation. Um, and um, let me go to the next slide. Get a little video for you here. While that's playing, I'll tell you that there, uh, that, you know, like I, we said earlier in the quiz, nine liters of wine make a, a, a liter of eau de vie. The, uh, um, there are a few deci decisions that the, the um, distiller will make, which is whether to, or not to distill on the lease. There is, um, they can decide the, the pace and the duration of the heating. Oh, and, and, and the, the, by the way, the, the stills are always fired by direct heat. Um, that's uh, that's a, a unique thing within cognac. And um, whether or not to redistill the heads and tails and um, the percentage of the heads or tails to be removed are all decisions that the distiller would make. But the resultant distillate is, as I said, called eau de vie. It's not cognac until it's been aged. And the aging has to happen in, um, in a certain order as well. The, the, the barrels that are first used, first of all, the barrels are made of wood that's been seasoned. There are traditionally two different types of wood that are, are used. Um, one would be the, the limousine or a uh, or the troncaise. So here we have wide grain wood, which is uh, allows for deeper penetration and we have fine grain wood that is a bit tighter. And each of these types of wood produce different flavor characteristics, which you can see some of the images uh, on the bottom there that, that show that. Um, the fine grain trees grow very tight and long and straight like that, as you can see that in the sketch, uh, they're, they're planted and, and the French have hundreds of years of forestry management. Uh, it's it's absolutely fascinating to go to a cooperage and and see this. Um, these two different kinds of wood produce different flavor characteristics, and that's why they're used. The majority are the wide grain, that is uh, most of what is used in, in in cognac production, but some fine grain is used as well. And the toasting is very different in in compared to American wood and charring. The 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 toasting is done with with light heat. And the barrels, the staves of the barrels are bent using uh, that light heat and then put together and toasted rather than with the American wood in bourbon production, you see how steam is used to bend the staves and then almost like a jet engine blows fire through it to, tr to create that char. Very different effects on the wood. The intensity of the heat, the time of the heating, um, all of that goes into the characteristics that you're going to get out of that wood when crafting a barrel, and that can be defined in concert with the with the producer, the, with the cognac producer and the, the cooperage in order to define where their cognac is going to go and what flavor characteristics. 
go ahead to the next. Very important though that the, there's seasoning. The seasoning for the for this wood, which is where they they cut the staves and they stack it uh, in a in a manner that allows for air to pass through it. That air drying over time allows the tannins to to seep out, and it happens. It's done for up to three years, and so it, much longer than American oak tends to be seasoned if it is seasoned at all in uh, American whiskey barrel production, American oak barrel production for American whiskey. And so again, the, the, the change there is significant to the tannins that will go into the, the distillate over time during aging and there, the tannins provide fattiness and structure. And so by aging, you also eliminate some of the other characteristics that you don't want in there. And so it's a, a, a different type of barrel production and that is really important to the way that this spirit is aged. The wood uh, for the first year of this spirit's life aging is going to be new wood. It's put into new wood and then after a year it's removed from the barrel and put into older wood because unlike American whiskey, uh, we're not looking for tremendous influence of the wood character in the spirit because it's really about more of the oxidation and um, other characteristics that happen in, in the concentration of during evaporation and such over the lifespan of the aging process that is going to define the character of the spirit um, in conjunction with the, with the, the grapes and the distillate, um, what, the, what the grapes provide. So we take it out of that new wood. And when, when they say, I put it in quotes like that, air quotes, because the new wood, that wood could be used again, say, you, say you've aged it in, in a barrel for a year, that barrel could be used another time or, or two before it is exhausted. And then you put into something else where it's really just um, to, to allow to, to hold the liquid and allow for that, that oxidation and, and uh, aging to happen over time. Um, go ahead to the next slide. The, um, also the, the, where we are aging the barrels is, is significant. There are two types of cellars. There's a, uh, a dry cellar and a wet cellar. And the dry cellars are in constructed floors, usually elevated off the ground. Wet cellars are usually, um, are, are damp earthen floors. And when you go into a dry cellar, it's, it, you, 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 can, you can feel that it, the, the ambient environment is dry, it's, it's um, crisp, and that allows, that ambient environment allows for a different kind of aging and effect on the, on the spirit than in a wet cellar. When you go into the wet cellar, you have that dampness, that humidity, there's spider webs all over the casks and mold on the walls and, and all of that earthiness and, and um, character gets into the spirit that's aged in a wet cellar. And so another aspect of the blending process and creating a, a, a crafting a, a, a cognac is taking the flavor characteristics of a dry cellared cognac and combining it with the characteristics of a wet cellared cognac. And so it gives the winemaker or the, the, the cognac maker uh, a, a lot more options in blending. It's like having that many more ingredients and different characteristics. And the, um, the Roncio or the um, Roncio Charentes is, the, is that earthy kind of mushroom character that's kind of funky. Um, that will develop in longer aging. So if you look at this, I don't know if you call it a chart or a craft, in the earlier years of the aging process, you're gonna get more of these warm baking spice notes um, as well from the wood primarily, that's when they're gonna come out. And then you're also gonna have a brighter fresh fruit kind of characteristics. And when, when you look at the, the, the flavor wheel later, um, the, the fresh fruit characteristics are in the younger cognacs. And as we get out to the older cognacs is when you're gonna see a lot of that dried fruit character. And it makes sense, right? The, the, the fresh fruit becomes dried fruit over time. And as that dries out, it's all about the same kind of thing, the 
concentration of flavor, the concentration of sweetness, and development of character over time. So as you can see, when we go to 10 to 20 to 30 to, to 50, we start to see um, in the 30 range, we start to see some more of those, those nuts and that leather and tobacco and, and then all these floral characteristics come out. And then we get into these tropical notes uh, even further out into the, the older agings. Now you see it, it maxes out at 50 years there. So when you look at a, the aging environment of a spirit, from place to place, right? If we go to say Kentucky and you talk about 100 degree swings in Kentucky from summer to winter and a bourbon really kind of peaking at around 12, eight to 12 years. Um, there's you know a lot of argument in American whiskey about whether a bourbon over 12 years is worth a damn. Um, and when you get into the older agings of, of American whiskeys, then you're really, you're challenged by over oaked spirit. And then those used bourbon barrels go off to Scotland and they, they get aged, uh, you know, a, a, a Scotch whiskey is looking at a, a 12, 15, 18. And the reason you see those agings is because in that ambient environment, which is not just temperature, it's barometric pressure that, that really affects the aging of the spirit over time. In Scotland, where it is cooler and, and, and much different than Kentucky, you, you have different timing. You have different timing in the Caribbean for rum and how spirits age in the Caribbean, in the islands, in around all that water, that humidity. It's very different from the way tequila ages in the middle of, of, of Mexico and Central America and that, and that place, and in, in especially in uh, Jalisco, whether it's in the highlands or the lowlands. All these areas are different, so they have different effects. And here in Cognac, we have those wet and dry cellars and again, we're, we're not looking at wood as much wood influence over time, but when we get out to about 45 years, that's about max, 45 to 50 years, 50 years is rare that they will leave it in barrel. At that point in time, that XO cognac, those, those con that really old special cognac is gonna be pulled from the barrel and put into demijohn. The demijohns are these big glass, um, containers, usually wrapped in wicker, you've seen pictures, um, and, and then they're, they're protected and they're put into a, an area of the cellar called the Paradis, which is the paradise, which is the, the, the place where those are guarded and, and saved and used in blends for their richness and their character that they're going to add into that. So as we get, um, I'm not sure if we have, what's the next slide? Let's see if we have an aging that talks about, um, yeah, yeah, so I guess we can stay on this now. We have VS, VSOP and XO, and now extra, extra, XXO is a new character, as new aging, but VS is at least two years. Um, VSOP is at least four years. XO is uh, at least 10 years. And then XXO, I, I actually can't remember now because it's a new designation. I think it's at least 15 years, but um, that means that the youngest cognac in the blend has to hit that, that character. So in VS, you have mostly younger, mostly uh, a, a bulk of eau de vie that comes from um, a, a more pro higher producing regions of, and, and, and volume, right? And then so you usually have somewhere between two and 10 years of age in a VS cognac. In the VSOP, we're looking at a minimum of four years. And the uh, from four years out, you're probably getting into more like 15 to 20 years on the high end of, of cognacs that are gonna be blended into a VSOP. And yeah, a lot of this is economics, right? They're looking for bottles that they can sell at these different price points, but also they are different characteristics. We're seeing those younger, brighter fruits in the VSs, a little bit um, more in your face on the alcohol because it hasn't mellowed out over time as much, uh, less of that, the, the, those complexities of the older cognacs. In the VSOP, we're getting a little bit more influence as that, um, of that, uh, of those higher, better characteristics, or not better, but more unique characteristics in the older 
uh, cognacs. And then when we get into the exos, we're, a lot of exos are starting, they had been starting at 10 years minimum and older, which is another reason why the, the BNIC pushed this. It used to be, had to be a minimum of eight years on the, on the uh, or six years on the exo, and now it's up to 10. So um, that only went into place a couple of years ago. So we're, we're seeing everything that's coming out now that's, it has to be a minimum of 10 in there. And when you get into these more in the exos, you're really not going to see these, these cognacs that have been aged 45 years that are resting in demijohn in too many VSOPs. Some you will. Some, some, are, are, some VSOPs are better than, than some exos. And you're basically, they're using little bits that that old, really old cognac is concentrated and it's got incredible character. And I've, I've had the pleasure of, of being in some of these cellars um, with the cellar master and pulling cognac out of casks that were amazing. It's one of the, the most in, and really most incredible experiences I've ever had. And, and I've been very fortunate to travel the world and, and, and go to many different regions and, and study spirits. And being in these cellars and pulling from some of those casks is absolutely uh, you know, something you put on your, on your, on your to-do list um, for sure. So, um, Angel's share, uh, and it, I, I want to say it's around 4%, um, that number, maybe a little higher or lower, um, possibly lower, I, th I think, but I think it's about 4% uh, in the region. Why don't we go on to the next slide? I think an important thing to remember here is that the, that is blending. Il faut imaginer ces eaux de vie à travers euh, un long vieillissement, ce qu'elles sont aujourd'hui et ce qu'elles éventuellement elles peuvent devenir. Donc euh, il faut une vraie humilité face à ce travail euh, discret de ces eaux de vie. Parce qu'on n'est jamais sûr du résultat. Let's get into consumption. Next slide, please. So these are some uh, pairings that were recommended by chefs that, uh, that the BNIC approached about the way that a, a number of, of the, the top uh, French chefs pair cognac with different foods. You're gonna get uh, a link to this so you can come back to a lot of this. Um, and you can review this. I'm not sure it's, if it's provided another way too, but if you're looking for different ways, you can see from uh, frozen VS is kind of a, a, a thing now. It's a, um, that, that you'll see in, in restaurants in France in particular, uh, and some of the stuff that that's paired with, and then VS, VSOP, and XO across from left to right, you see at the top, and some different things that these are recommendations from, from some great chefs. So this is part of the the Cognac Pairing app, which is an app you can find, and I, I might want to download it now. I believe it's going away, um, but um, it's out there now, and you can find some of this on there. Go ahead to the next slide, please. I, a significant part of that, and this here at the Aroma Wheel, is that Cognac is a very good spirit for pairing with food, and I don't say that um, with a lot of spirits and I, I love all spirits, I'm a spirits geek, uh, I drink everything, but I really find uh, and believe that cognac is an excellent spirit for pairing with food. I don't think most spirits do pair very well with food um, and it makes for great co uh, cocktails. It's, it's the, the high acidity in it, it makes it um, excellent and appetizing um, just to sip some of these crisper ones. I think uh, uh, the, the younger agings in particular are great before a meal. They're, they are, they're great for cocktails. And then of course, uh, um, some, a lot of that works with particular foods that, that are with the meal. And then the richer, older stuff, of course, makes for great desserts. Um, the Aroma here, Wheel here, again, is, is an excellent guide. I think Aroma Wheels are very, um, very useful when you're trying to analyze something and, and figure it out. A lot of pop, people have problems when they're, when they're tasting and they're, they're evaluating a spirit. Um, if, you if you don't do it a lot and you don't talk about it a lot and uh, uh, you, the words might not come to you. And so a, an aroma wheel is a great visual aid in 
uh, in evaluating something. And there are aroma wheels for, for cognac, for whiskeys, for tequila. You can find them all online. Um, I think they're great tools. This one is, uh, is really helpful in keeping up in front of you when you're trying to go through and, and if the words aren't coming to you, pull out the, the descriptors that, you know, you're sitting there like, what is that note? What is that note? And then you can look at it. Oh yeah, it's apricot, dried apricot. That's it. Um, the, that's a, a great tool for you if you're just starting and tasting. And I still use aroma wheels uh, when, when I'm trying to get focused and, and, and get warmed up, especially. On to the next wheel, next wheel, next slide. In order to experience cognac's full taste. range of aromas, we recommend to use a tulip glass, or if not, a wine glass. The funnel shape of the tulip glass opens outwards to gradually evade the aromas of the cognac without letting the alcohol overpower the overall impression. Fill your glass with several centiliters of cognac. There's no need to overfill your glass to awaken your senses. All right, we're gonna to go to our first one here. This is uh, the Cognac Park Carte Blanche VS. This is one of my favorite VSs. Um, I had a uh, nice nice piece of press there in, in December and I remember it was GQ or Esquire. Uh, one of those did a, an article on recommendations for Cognacs to, put in your house. So this is one I recommended for that article. Um, I think this is a, it has got a lot of nice character. Uh, I know not everybody on the call has the, uh, the cognacs with them. Uh, for those who do, and you um, are interested in sharing some, some of your notes on tasting and aroma, feel free to pop those into the chat and let us know what you think. Love to see what what people see or hear or, or or taste in here. If you don't have the sample set and you have some cognacs of your own at home, go ahead and taste a, a, the VS um, that you might have in front of you. Plum, white grape. Yep. See those that that white grape. I think. Uh, this is where I, you really, um, yeah, that fresh quality, right? That fresh fruit is like, it's one of the great things about a VS. I think VS gets overlooked a lot uh, because everybody wants to go for the XO. They want to go for the big, the big guns, but uh, these are phenomenal. Like I said, prior to a meal to open up your palate, they're great for, for mixing. And they're great for really understanding the essence of cognac. I like to make the comparison to a Blanco uh, tequila because when, you, when you're trying to understand and learn about tequila, you, you have to go to the Blanco, right? Because the Blanco is where it starts. It's the unaged, it's the essence of the, of the agave and of, of that producer's spirit. And then the repo, the añejo, the extra añejo are just expressions of how it ages over time and whatever decisions they make in that aging process. Um, not quite to me, although I love my tequila and I love my agave spirits, not quite as complex as cognac, uh, but, but a VS is that first expression. And again, because these are blends, very different from tequila in that the VSOP blend and the XO blend are gonna be completely different blends than the VS blend. They're, they're not, the VSOP is not the VS aged extra long. You know, it's, it's a completely different blend. And so it's a completely different product from the VS. So you can't evaluate those agings within one house in the same way. Stone, yeah, those stone fruits I think are, uh, you're going to find a lot of stone fruits throughout cognac. I think there's lots of them, and that's one of the things I, I love about it. The pepperiness is going to be an, a, a, a function of the distillate. The alcohol, I think, um, you know, a lot of that dissipates over time. Definitely some nice citrus. 
Why don't we go ahead and uh, pour the next BS? If you've had time to read that slide about Cognac Park. Um, I don't get too much into the houses on my uh, presentations. Uh, there, I just think that um, you can you can research the houses, and this isn't you know this isn't a brand um, exercise. But the, and and I always say it's hard to find a bad cognac. I don't really know any producers that make bad cognac. And these these are all excellent. They're all unique. They're all very different. Um, and I think that is the I think the the blending aspect of cognac is the key to that. And there's uh, uh, there's a lot of uh, kind of butting heads about cognac and Armagnac. And I love Armagnac, but um, some of the some of the negative commentary you may hear about cognac is that it's all it's all very similar and that, and to me that's just a demonstration of ignorance because you the you can't um, ex understand the differences of all these if you don't really appreciate how all of the different opportunities that cognac producers have for creating flavor in the blending process and uh, that's the key to it. That's what makes cognac so excellent is this, this, this great creativity. And uh, like being a great bartender, making excellent cocktails, understanding every one of your ingredients is, is, a, is a core component to creating something that ultimately comes together and is the sum of its parts and therefore is, uh, is special and unique. And these two, now I wanted to move on to the next so that you can have the side by side. and. If you give a, a good nose on both of those, very different. I get lots of creme brulee, caramel, and uh, nougat on the nose on the second, and much brighter stone fruit, peach, almost like a peach juice on the first. Definitely apricot, a lot of caramelized notes of, uh, on the second. Yeah, right? Pleasantly surprising. I like that. This is a brand, um, the Maokao, I'm not even, to be honest, completely sure how to pronounce it, that you don't see a lot of in the US. Um, but I have had this in a lot of my, in a lot of my cl classes and tastings, and it's a brand that I really like. I believe it does very well in China. Uh, China is a very big market for cognac. I mean, that for a VS, that's super rich. I, I wonder, I, I bet they're the youngest in this is probably like eight years or something. I'd be surprised if it's less than that, but that's excellent. But yeah, lots of honey. I like that. All right, let's move on to the next. If we are uh, going on to our VS, VSOP. Um, we're into the Croissier. Bread pudding, I like that. That's a great descriptor. Yeah, throw all those out there. All right, I'm gonna put my VSOP in here, my Croissier. Very different again. Try to keep, you know, you've got plenty of cognac here, I believe. Um, to keep going back and forth. I love to, when I'm doing a tasting as broad as this, we've got eight in front of us. I'm, I'm going to try to get moving through them so we can get to the, the cocktail and see how we're doing on time here. Um, you know, this is booked for an hour. It's not, we're coming up on an hour. We're probably going to go, just so you know, we're probably going to go um, to, a, um, I don't know, hour and 15, hour and 30, somewhere in there. We'll see how far it goes. But this is to me, you know, the most enjoyable part. I've realized that m some people may drop off where they're, if they're not doing the tasting, but um, if you can hang on and listen, uh, there is still a lot to be learned, even though you're not, um, you're not tasting it. You can see the reactions from people and their notes. Vasya VSOP, uh, obviously a, a huge brand. Um, I really think that they 
that they shine in, in this area, their, their VSOP. Um, well, absolutely uh, widespread and, and available, not hard to find this. Really well-rounded. Yeah, I'm looking at some of these notes. Um, why don't we go ahead and pour the hardy too? I don't know if you uh, again. You'll you'll get time to um, you, uh, look at the presentation and read these notes. Um, I have to say, hardy is a brand that um, I didn't know much about years ago, and uh, they have been very um, generous about providing samples in, in our tastings. And I've had I've been through most of their lineup, and it is definitely a, an impressive house that. I think, um, again, doesn't have a, as much of a presence in the US, but uh, is growing. I've definitely seen it grow over the years and, uh, and I've been very happy with their uh, samples that I've, that I've had. Mm, that's lovely. I think, you know, Raisin is like one of those notes in, in cognac that um, obviously it's a grape, um, but it's just like in, in bourbon, you can say vanilla and caramel and just about every, but some you get really get a nice raisiny um, quality that's made more complex with warm baking spice and, and other notes like this. But I get, I get that big raisin kind of prune in here, which is going from that fresh plum note that I I got a lot of plum in that park. And now going into this VSOP, I'm getting a lot of that prune, which show, to me says that there's a good amount of more aged in here, a little bit richer, definitely some tobacco, brown butter, I love that. Mm. Lovely. And again, now we've got four glasses in front of us. Go ahead and go back and forth, especially between the VSOPs. And you'll notice some nice differentiation there. I get a bit more leather and oak on the Courvoisier and still going back to the VS, a lot more bright fruit on the nose. So you see that increase in maturity of the spirit going into the VSOP. All right, let's go on to number six, the Jean-Luc Pesquet. My French is horrible. So I know the, uh, the team is probably, the French side of our team is probably laughing at some of my pronunciation. I need to work on that. <laughs> I'm just a humble boy from New Jersey. Oh, this one's got a, I'm to get that off. There we go. All right. This is the organic. And um, I don't see, it says on here, but um, nope. This does not have an age designation. And this is kind of a good demonstration of where the, uh, yeah, it has really light color, where um, a lot of producers are going and creating new product that is not beholden to norms in that uh, you don't have, kind of like in whiskey, we have the, the non-age statement movement that's happened in the last five to 10 years. Um, you're seeing this in cognac more and more where the blends are not dependent upon the, um, on the age statement. So they're, they're trying to not poison the well a bit before you taste it and set up your, um, your, your expectations on the age and just leaving it to itself. That does have a nice crisp, clear appearance. Yep, 
Yeah, definitely soft. I like that. I saw somebody said um, like a Japanese whiskey. It does quite remind me a bit of that. Almost a maltiness, which you wouldn't really expect in a grape spirit. But I do get that from time to time. It's definitely floral. Light and crisp. And interesting because I guess because of its lightness and, 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 and color and character all, all I would I would assume in a blind tasting that this was a VS but it has a lot of that nice floral character that usually develops a bit more in an a, a more aged spirit again the art of the blender choosing the character of, choosing the cognacs to, to put in the blend that obviously they were avoiding that big bold, buttery, um, aged character. Nice, light, crisp. I like it. I would, this would be lovely with some oysters, um, a salad, a starting course for sure. Um, and I would mix it fairly lightly with, uh, with some bright juices. It's, it's kind of light in character that I wouldn't want it to get lost, but it is delicate. Great, that's a great word for it. The, uh, and the packaging's nice. I mean, this is just a sample bottle, but I like that. This is another thing that you're getting with these, uh, with a lot of the newer um, products coming out. I think, I think something that's really quite cool and, uh, interesting it, that's happening in the market is uh, this new generation of, of, of producers that are coming in are younger and they're bringing a, a modern approach to cognac. They're both in the, the style and in, in the way that they're blending and, and the stuff that's coming out, but also in stuff like this, the graphic design, the bottle design, they're giving cognac a, a bit of a new face and uh, I think that's, that's quite exciting to see because it's going to help the category expand and, and provide for more adoption from a, a younger audience. Um, that may not, you know, in, in some character, I've seen this and in, in, I remember going to, going to Brazil to train some bartenders 10 years ago and uh, nobody wanting to drink cachaça because it was what their parents drank. And you see that kind of character in happening uh, in places in France, it's happened before, and it it eventually comes around. And I think that's what's happening here, as we're seeing. Like, this is such a you know, pride of France, the the brandy regions, um, and cognac in particular is so significant. And uh, it's great to see the new generations coming in producing quality product. Let's move on to the the next here. The um, can you read that? And through the grapevine. Oh, this is oh, over uh, no, we're on the Pierre Ferrand, the 10 generations. Um, I'm a big fan of Ferrand. Um, I've been very personally friendly with the with the company for some time now and uh, and people involved in it and have always enjoyed the cognacs. Uh, Alexandre Gabriel has uh, been a, a significant force in the industry. I believe he's a former president of the BNIC recently. Um, and uh, this is their, a newer product, 46% ABV. So bumping it up a bit, that I'd like to see as well. I think the majority of these have been 40 and that's kind of traditional. You'll see that, that 40% um, uh, and 46 kicks it up a bit. And of course, with a little higher alcohol, we get a little bigger bump in flavor recognition. Yeah, right. I agree, Alexander. That it's um, nice and mellow. Really uh, doesn't have a big bite, but it's got a. It really hits the back of the palate. Super chocolate. That nose is beautiful, and so different from the organic. 
Go ahead and stick your nose back in a couple of those other glasses. Ooh, Nutella, hazelnuts and chocolate. That's great. Really floral too, though. Ooh, that's a nice, I like that, Jillian. That's a <laughs> good long descriptor. Yeah, I mean, chocolate, great pairing um, with any cognac. I mean, my two favorite things really to pair with chocolate are cognac and um, really good Caribbean rum and Henri Lamont whiskey. That's lovely. All right, we'll go on now to our next. What's the next in the lineup on the slides? Ah, Bon Pinot. This right here was my favorite cognac before I became an educator. And I gotta say, I keep a bottle of this in the house. I absolutely love the Fompino. I had the pleasure of having lunch in that castle right there, the castle on the on the label. And of course, it's not on your sample label in these sample bottles, but this is an absolutely lovely XO. To me, it's a quintessential cognac. This is a, something I gift, um, I drink, I sell in my bar. I love this product. Beautiful fruit on the nose. It this this just brings me right back into the cellar. Absolutely fabulous. I like to think of spirits in the in the ways of like I would buy it. I would drink it, I would gift it, I would sell it. And uh, this is, uh, this ticks all the boxes for me. And I'm going to be uh, using that scale in a new Instagram account I started for reviews called Boozy Musings. If you want to follow me at Boozy Musings, hard to say, kind of rhymes and fun, but I'm going to start posting some spirit reviews on that Instagram account soon. And this is that character ticking all the boxes. Frappin is a, 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 a great house in particular. The Fompino is uh, especially um, unique from the rest of the line. I also like the Frappin Extra is another one of their XOs. Uh, their VS is excellent. Um, this is a house that I've had a lot of exposure to. And so I really like the um, the range within the entire line. Uh, I've known um, some people at the at the brand there as well for a while, so that helps. Alain Royer uh, has, has been a very big mentor to me in cognac, and uh, he still works with his brand, and. Uh, so let's take that and we'll go to our last product, the uh, Through the Grapevine. This one uh, I have not had yet. I'm excited to give this a try. So this is uh, an, an example of something that happens um, quite a bit in the industry where you see it says that their family, usually used in the blend of large houses. This is uh, something really quite cool within the industry that a lot of smaller producers, they, they are allowed to retain some production for themselves and sell it uh, as their own brand. And so sometimes a house will produce eau de vie for one of the big houses for a long time. And that's kind of their, their bread and butter where they make all their money. 
and then they can have the pride of their own little house. Sometimes they sell it very small and locally, sometimes just in France, and sometimes they expand it out to the rest of the world. And so this is a, uh, an interesting one um, that says uh, it, it's a single cask from the smallest terroir in Cognac, the Borderies region, which it's the, that region, the, it's a little, that little, the smallest uh, spot on the map is Borderies. It's just across the river uh, from the town of Cognac in on, just across the Charent River. And uh, so it has a very similar soil to Petit Champagne and uh, to Grand Champagne. Grand Champagne is that, that next largest region. And um, so, you know, the, the, the general thought is that Grand Champagne produces the, the, the best grapes for long aging and then Petit Champagne and then Borderies is kind of right in that same realm. And uh, we didn't have time to get into the different soil structures and why that affects the grapes so much, but that's the idea here. And so Borderies is very special. I believe this is a project from uh, if I'm not mistaken, it's brand through the grapevine is a pro a project from La Maison de Whiskey in Paris, but I'm not quite sure. Um, and so they're buying, it's kind of like an independent bottler in that they're they're sourcing uh, from different houses. Um, thanks, Amanda. And if you've never been La Maison de Whiskey uh, in Paris, one of the best lip, liquor stores in the world, one of the greatest. If you're a spirits geek, which I imagine you are, if you're at, on this class, um, to, to, to go through there is like just like gawking at the shelves and shopping there is a fabulous exper experiment. And uh, you can find stuff like this. They create a lot of great uh, products as well. Mm. That is fabulous. Let's look at that against the Frappin. Very different. You know, that's a good question. Is this 52? I, yeah, there's not a lot of info on this sample label. I don't know, maybe somebody uh, at Tuin can pop in some info on that. This is the nicest surprise of the night for me. Mm. I like that. Yeah, all those botanicals. Ryan, spot on. It's like really com di different, really complex, but mm -hmm. fabulous. All right. H, while you set up your fresh Victor, we have a question from Mark Sassy who wanted you to just describe the difference between on the leaves versus off the leaves. Um, yeah, sure. The the leaves are the the residual uh, from the grape crushing from the winemaking process um, that will. Um, um, Provide different character. Uh, they they have a big influence on on the flavor development within the winemaking process, and they can be filtered out. It's um um. It, that's one of the decisions that the producer can make um, when uh, going from wine to distilling. That's going to change the character of the spirit. All right. Well, with that, I'm going to uh, get you into some fresh cocktails and that's the that, i think that is the uh, one of the issues with the the use of cognac in cocktails is that that people don't think about using it so much in fresh cocktails and think of it more in boozy cocktails uh or, or cocktails versus sours or punches or um and Fresh Victor is uh, admittedly a company that I am uh, a part of. And uh, this is a, a line of cold press juice based fresh cocktail mixers that we created particularly for 
making cocktail fresh cocktails easy to make. And so we have uh, these seven different flavors. There's basically a lime sour and a lemon sour. The lime sour is Mexican lime and agave, which is great for using in uh, a daiquiri, which I'm gonna make in a second. Um, and what the, the drink that we're gonna make today is the brandy smash or the cognac smash in particular. And that's gonna use our three citrus and mint. And the three citrus and mint has lemon, lime, and orange as our three citruses. And um, some fresh mint that, that's grown right near our farm, right here in, in Camino, California. Uh, we have national distribution for this. Um, and it comes in 64 ounce packages for uh, restaurants and bars too. So it's not just a consumer product. This is for bars and restaurants. And uh, I, you can reach out to me for more information about that. But this is the three citrus and mint. And I'm gonna use three ounces of this. And my, this is a three ounce, one and a half ounce jigger. I'm gonna put that right into my tin. And then I'm going to use an ounce and a half of cognac. And use, uh, actually, I have, a, I have a bottle of Park VS here. If you don't have a full ounce and have a one thing, go ahead and make a blend. Pretend you're a cognac blender and make yourself a blend, but give yourself an ounce and a half of cognac, whichever you want to put in there, and put that right on top. So all of our products are made to mix easily at two to one plus dilution and chill. So I'm gonna throw my ice in here now. Give that a good shake. So I had four and a half of ounces of pre-diluted and chilled liquid going into my shaker. Where'd my strainer go? I don't know, oh, there it is. And I'm gonna ice up my Collins glass, whatever kind of glass you like, and just fill that right up. And that's gonna give me a beautiful cognac smash with nice fresh citrus fruits, mint, and delicious cognac. Throw a mint sprig on there to get a nice garnish or maybe a three wheels of the three different citruses, any of those that plus a mint garnish, super fresh, delicious um, expression of a fresh cognac drink. When you go to cognac, when you go and, and to French restaurants and bars and get cognac drinks, you're gonna find a lot of fresh cocktails being made. And that's where I think uh, the opportunity for cognac is in American bars and restaurants. It is, of course, the Sazerac is great, uh, but if you look at like the classics of, of crustas and um, using cognac, the, the history of using cognac in cocktails, going back through all of the great co cocktail books from the 19th century up to prohibition, you see anytime it says French brandy, there that, that was cognac. And when you look at anything that a lot of the time cognac was actually mentioned by name, but uh, anytime it says brandy, that was primarily what was being used. So the next drink that I'll show you real quick is a cognac daiquiri, which I'm gonna do the same, but I'm, I'm gonna use the different proportion, as I said, all of our stuff works really well in a three ounce to one and a half ounce or three to two, depending on how boozy you want it. But um, some of some drinks really work a little bit better on a one to one ratio. So on the uh, exactly cognac khaki, I like that. Um, I'm going to do two ounces of Mexican lime and agave and two ounces of cognac. And this works really well because it allows the, the, the spirit to be a bit more bracing, and which is what you want in a daiquiri. So this 
So the difference between that three to one or that two to one or one to, or one to one ratio um, is something you can play with depending on your drink. I'm gonna put that into my cocktail glass. And I wasn't so fancy to uh, make myself garnishes here in my living room, but the cognac gaki. <laughs> I'm gonna use that. I gotta look back in the chat to see who said that, but <laughs> I think that's great. A couple of nice fresh cocktails at uh, 125 in the afternoon here in San Francisco. Um, you can uh, email me at h at uh, cocktailambassadors.com for any information on, uh, on Fresh Victor and please support Fresh Victor and uh, please make great fresh cocktails. Cognac is a, a phenomenal spirit to use in fresh juice cocktails. Uh, play with it, experiment, put it in place of other age spirits. Remember that that lineage of flavor from barrel aged spirits goes from one category to another because of the commonality of those notes that come from the wood. And so any cocktail that you've got with a, an aged spirit, whether it's a whiskey cocktail or an añejo tequila cocktail or an aged rum cocktail, you can play with your spirits and come up with something that's gonna be very unique. And putting cognac into that formula is, uh, is fabulous. Thank you all very much for being here today. I hope you have a, a great end of your day, wherever you are. Um, still got a bit of time here in California. My, um, my Instagram, again, is, so that is uh, at Cocktail Ambassadors. That's a, that's a great place to start. At Elixir SF is my bar. And uh, at Cognac USA for the Cognac program. Um, at Fresh Victor Cocktails for Fresh Victor.